Well, hello there, you're watching the press preview. A first look then to see what's on the front pages. Uh, time to see what is making those headlines with the New Statesman's senior associate editor, Rachel Cunliffe, and the Sun's political editor, Harry Cole. Great to see both of you. So let's uh, check out the front pages, shall we? Starting with The Guardian. It leads with further criticism of the Prime Minister for his comments to Sir Keir Starmer about Jimmy Savile after the Labour leader was confronted by angry protesters outside the House of Commons. Same story for the Metro, the headline, Keir flees hate mob. And likewise, the I, which proclaims police rescue Starmer from mob as the PM faces a crunch 48 hours. But away from those troubles, the Prime Minister writes for The Times, insisting Britain will not flinch over the possibility of conflict in Ukraine. A group of northern newspapers, including the Hull Daily Mail, the Liverpool Echo and the Manchester Evening News, all carrying the same front page, pleading with the levelling up secretary, Michael Gove, don't leave us behind. Despite concerns it could dent efforts towards carbon neutrality, the Telegraph understands six North Sea oil and gas fields could be approved this year. And the FT examines what could happen to Greek and Italian borrowing costs if the European Central Bank raises interest rates. Well, a reminder that by scanning the QR code you'll see on your screen during the programme, you can check out those front pages while you watch us. So let's bring in our guests then, Rachel Cunliffe and Harry Cole. Welcome to both of you. Um, goodness me, Rachel, uh, what happened to Sir Keir Starmer and um, what was the cause of that? It's harrowing stuff, isn't it? You showed a very brief clip there. There were photos, blurry photos in, in some of the, the papers. So he was caught up in what, what appears to have been a, a, a rally or a protest uh, against vaccinations. And um, as, as, as we know, one conspiracy theory often leads to another conspiracy theory. And as well as being accused of being a traitor for his positions on, on vaccines, uh, professors also made comments about Jimmy Savile and protecting Jimmy Savile, which we can only assume is a direct result of the Prime Minister making the false claim last week that Keir Starmer, as director of prosecutions, was directly responsible and personally responsible for uh, Savile not being prosecuted at the time. Now, that is one, false, uh, but it is two, a, a conspiracy theory associated with the far right in some very unpleasant corners of the internet. So I don't think it's that surprising that when Starmer was caught up in this, this anti-vax rally, where a lot of people sadly believe some very misleading and false claims about vaccines, those two conspiracy theories seem to have melded together and created a, a rather terrifying situation, although uh, reports are that he is now back in his office safe, so he was unharmed from this, which I guess is the silver lining. Yeah, but it's led to a series of headlines which don't make for a, for a happy start to the week for Downing Street once again. Poison, Johnson's poison, says The Guardian. Metro, Keir flees the hate mob. The Eye, police rescue Starmer from the mob. Um, and the important thing about this, I guess, Harry, is the reaction from people once again in his own party. Yeah, the same, the same half dozen names that we've been hearing for the last four weeks have popped up and, uh, and, and said how outrageous Boris Johnson is. It's almost like a... A horrible. There's a slight. I have a slight unease with this story because some of the glee in which critics are, uh, are on both sides are trying to politicise this. I don't remember the same outpouring uh, of anger from Labour MPs or these Tory MPs who have rushed to the airwaves and rushed to their Twitter accounts when Jacob Rees-Mogg or Michael Gove or the BBC's Nick Watt or GB News's Tom Harwood were caught up by this same bunch of absolute scumbags. Um, they're loitering around Westminster more and more. They're horrible, horrible people who will shout and bay down anyone that looks vaguely like they've been, once been on television or, or a popular well-known face who's once maybe suggested that you should get a vaccine. Um, I think there's a, there's a slight glee, as I said, in, in, in some of this. Um, not least also because it's a little bit too convenient. You can't say that... Uh, Boris Johnson was taking his ideas from the far right. And then, lo and behold, when the far right turn up in, in Parliament and, and say the same things, that suddenly all the Prime Minister's fought and he somehow emboldened them. I'm not quite sure that's true. They've been screaming pedo defender at people uh, passing all the time. Is it terrible, terrible uh, 
a terrible situation for Dan Street? Absolutely. It's an unforced own you know, com- error, a complete own goal, and one that probably, it feels like about a million years ago since he said it, but it was only a week ago that Boris Johnson made those remarks. It might just be probably for the best just to knock him on the head. Absolutely, and that that is what people want, isn't it? He's already lost one of his most loyal advisers to that, clearly, which will not have pleased him. Um, I think people did take seriously, didn't they? You know, Nick Watt from Newsnight, Anna Subri, another name you didn't you didn't mention there, who who had the same sort of the brain. Say it again. The very very list of people that have been targeted by that lot. That was a a brief uh, a brief highlight. OK. Um, so what, what's the chances, do you think, of the Prime Minister coming back and doing a, a fulsome, that's not what I meant, type apology on this, Rachel, do you think? Uh, probably quite unlikely, just because he's had so many opportunities to clarify. I mean, the, the, the Speaker of the House, the day after he made those comments, sort of asked if he wanted to... Well, withdraw them or to contextualise them. And he said no, and he, he doubled down. And now that the, the, he, he's lost one of his closest aides, Manira Mirza, who's been with him since his time as, as as London mayor, she quit last week. And her reason, she said her reason for quitting was that exact comment. I think to come back from it now is just too much of a, of, of a losing face kind of um, situation. And we know that Boris really doesn't like doing that when he's under fire he tends to double down and dig his heels in and, and actually um, sort of go over the top with, with, with what he said. Because actually, throughout most of his career, people have loved him when, he, when, he's, when he's done that. They like that show of strength. Just with this particular comment and this particular set of circumstances that Downing Street is in at the moment, it doesn't seem to be working. But it does rather look like he's backed himself into a corner. Beyond that, though, uh, the eye uh, pulling apart the relationship between uh, numbers 10 and 11 Downing Street. Tensions between number 10 and the Treasury grow, they say, with Sunak warned that he's in danger uh, of being reshuffled. And then the Chancellor's allies hit back at rivals they accuse of a very tiring, hostile briefing campaign. This amidst this sort of NHS recovery plan, which is not yet out, as we know. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of sniping all around. I will just make one more point while we've got it. If we are going to go down this road of let's talk about, you know, political language, David Lammy, the person that was involved in that, was never apologised for calling Tory MPs Nazis. I don't remember there being an outpouring of, 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 of outrage on a similar level with Angela Rayner and her Tory scum comments. Keir Starmer himself accusing the Prime Minister of being directly being responsible for people's deaths with the Johnson variant. John McDonald, you know... The, they, Keir Starmer was trying to make him shadow chance, trying to make him the Chancellor two years ago. And there's a man that said that Esther McVeigh should be lynched and the bombs and bullets of the IRA, um, for, you know, were a good thing. So I just think with this whole debate, let's, you know, step back a little bit. If we're, we are going to have a conversation about political language. It's got to go, it's got to go both ways. Um, on the back on the sort of <laughs> slightly uh, tedious day seven or eight of uh, of, of, of intercabinet civil war, um, I think it's been slightly overblown. The idea that Rishi Sunak could be reshuffled and Boris Johnson still be in power a month or two after that, I, I would be amazed. So yes, look, tempers fraying a bit. We saw a slightly awkward photo up of the two of them today in a Kent hospital, pretending they're all fine. Obviously, behind the scenes, things aren't that great. But, crucially, the Cabinet and the ministers still aren't moving against Boris Johnson. And until he does, until that payroll vote decides that's enough, um, let's do this, then, it really, this is he's going to sort of limp on, uh, limp on rather, than be, rather than be ousted. Until one of the Cabinet put their head above the parapet, frankly, um, it's, all, it's all kind of noise. You can tell I'm kind of slightly fed up from writing about this stuff for the last <laughs> two <laughs> Um, and, uh, Harry, I've done this in the wrong order again, because I was coming next to your exclusive story, which is about the new comms... Uh, what would you call it? New comms... Director of comms, thank you very much, Gita Harry, who we all know, is sat in your seat, to be fair, uh, doing this. Um, right, what's the latest on him? Because he's had an interesting day, hasn't he? Quickly, first day in the office... Oh, sorry, Rachel, Rachel, Rachel. Rachel no, 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 well, no, uh, no, OK. No, no. Look, Ra- OK, we've, we've got about a minute. So, Rachel, very quickly, what, what's he said that's caught the attention of people? Then, Harry, you can update us with your story. He said that the Prime Minister greeted him with a rendition of I Will Survive, which I would love to see. Um, Gita Harry is somebody who seems to have more jobs than George Osborne. GB News uh, and then lobbying on behalf of Huawei and the Chinese government, which I will let Harry talk about, uh, and now Chief of Comms to the PM. Interesting CV. Over to you, Harry. 
Yeah, look, not a great first day, uh, you would suggest. He appeared to have given a Welsh language interview and hoping that maybe not everyone would see it because it was in Welsh, where he lifted the lid on how he got the job with the Prime Minister, which included a, yeah, a rendition of I Will Survive. <laughs> but more serious than that, though, tonight we have leaked minutes from a meeting in 2020 where Goto Hari was representing um, uh, Huawei, the Chinese tech firm, lobbying his old pal, Eddie Lister, who he used to work with, with Boris Johnson at City Hall, asking which ministers he should nudge to get his client's way. Um, rather, no one likes seeing sausages made, and these are particularly sausages uh, if you buy the sun tomorrow. OK, good. We will discuss that more, I'm sure. We will have more time later on. Uh, stay there, both of you. Lots more stuff to come, including Macron and Putin meeting in Moscow. Uh, what could come next in Ukraine? Back with that in just a moment. watching the press preview with me now, Rachel Cunliffe and Harry Cole. Welcome back to both of you. Um, let's go to the world's longest table, shall we, Harry? Um, for the, as our correspondent described it, COVID-conscious Russian president. Uh, it's one way of looking at it. Anyway, lots of high-level meetings on Ukraine. Um, any, any optimistic signs, do you think? Not really. I mean, that is quite a photo up. You, uh, post Salisbury, post Polonium 824, whatever it was, you would sup with a long spoon if you were going near Putin. But um, I didn't think that actually, uh, actually the Kremlin that would offer up that that image. I think, I mean, you couldn't get a more perfect summary of how the West feel right now. Macron's doing a bit more than most to try and keep that dialogue open, but it doesn't seem to be going that well. Biden tonight saying uh, it's time for American citizens to probably leave the Ukraine, probably sensible. Doesn't like, doesn't feel like it's going well. The Prime Minister's written for the Times tomorrow with sort of language of we will not flinch, which doesn't, um, doesn't suggest that there's been much movement. Liz Truss is flying to uh, flying to Moscow later this week. Um, so I'm sure that will sort it all out. OK, yep, she's over her COVID. I'm sure they'll check before she... <laughs> she'll, she'll get the long table anyway, presumably, anyway. But to, anyway, to the um, Royal Shakespeare Company, front page of The Telegraph, uh, explain, Rachel, what this story's about. So this is a story on, on the front of The Telegraph saying that the Royal Shakespeare Company uh, plan to use Shakespeare plays to educate children about racism and sexism and uh, ableism in, in the plays um, because, and it's got a spokesperson there saying the worst thing you could do is, is deny that it's there. And this is on the front page of The Telegraph, so I'm guessing that The Telegraph isn't going to be a huge fan of this and is going to see this as political correctness gone mad. Um, but I'm a bit confused by it because I think it's kind of impossible to read most of Shakespeare's plays and not see the racism and, and the sexism. And that's kind of what the point of studying them is. You study Othello and you look at attitudes to race. You study The Taming of the Shrew and you look at attitudes to women. You study The Merchant of Venice and you look at attitudes to, to Jews. This is not new. So part of me wonders if this is possibly an attempt to get in there early uh, and, and ward off any efforts to cancel Shakespeare for being sexist and racist, which of course it, it, it is, by saying, no, 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 no it's, it's educational, even though it's exactly what generations and generations and generations of teachers have been doing basically for the last 500 years. It's interesting, though. Yeah. Rachel, thank you very much, Anita. I spot an English de degree coming out there at some point, maybe. <laughs> uh, Rachel, classic, Harry? Classic. Oh, classic. Oh, classic. Oh, 